In 2014, Marvel Comics started to change, leaning heavily into creating new diverse characters and shaking up established mantles. This was the same year that Jane Foster became Thor, Falcon became Captain America, and characters like America Chavez and Kate Bishop were given a much harder push. Regardless of where you sit on the argument of this change in direction being a good or a bad thing, I think it's hard to dispute that one of the main catalysts for this was the introduction of a brand new character named Kamala Khan, aka Ms. Marvel. Lover or hater, the fact of the matter is that Kamala took the comic book world by storm, leading to her first issue being so in demand that it got seven printings, a very rare feat that's usually only pulled off by big characters like Batman or Spider-Man. Kamala also resonated with young readers who weren't interested in comics prior, and she consistently topped the digital sales charts. But why did this happen? What made this book so worthwhile that Marvel decided to seemingly base their entire marketing strategy around her, a brand new character? Well, let's take a look and find out. But before we get too far into things, I want to give a big thank you to Keeps for their continued sponsorship of the channel. As y'all have heard me mention multiple times by now, two out of three guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they turn 35, and thankfully, Keeps is there to help out. They're a subscription service that makes it easy and affordable to treat male pattern baldness with generic versions of FDA-approved medications for hair loss. Every three months, you'll get the right treatment for you mailed directly to your door from a real licensed doctor, and since all the appointments are handled completely over the internet, there's zero reasons for boring doctor visits or pharmacy pickups. Plus, if you need to ask your doctor any questions or raise any concerns in between, then you can message them 24-7, and you can also track your progress by using their handy tracking tool. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, then go to keeps.com slash comicdrake, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's k-e-e-p-s dot com slash comicdrake. Big thank you for Keeps for all of your continued support, but now, let's get back to the video. Now, funnily enough, the story of Ms. Marvel actually goes back decades and decades with the release of a character named Captain Marvel. There's actually a ton of really interesting history here that I go into great detail about in a dedicated video about the subject, but to very quickly sum it all up, Captain Marvel used to be the most popular superhero in the entire world, but was sued out of existence by DC Comics, who was upset that he was outselling their Superman. Because this guy wasn't around anymore, Marvel Comics swooped in and took that name for themselves, creating Marvel, an alien warrior that became a superhero on Earth. Now, to be entirely honest, Marvel's Captain Marvel did not sell very well. But because DC got their hands on the rights to the old school Captain Marvel, Marvel Comics was forced to keep putting out books under that title in order to hold on to the trademark. And that's why DC's Captain Marvel books had to be sold under the name Shazam. Marvel tried their best to shake up their Captain Marvel series by constantly relaunching the book and even passing the mantle to new characters that they thought that fans would like better, but nothing seemed to click. For decades, Captain Marvel was a C-tier character that essentially bled the company tons of money. However, there was one side character that rose to the top and became a hit with readers, Carol Danvers, aka Ms. Marvel. Originally a government security officer, Carol got wrapped up with Marvel when he came to Earth, eventually resulting in her gaining powers from a machine that filled her with radiation. When Carol left the military, she became a writer, landing her the job of editor-in-chief at Woman Magazine, a subsidiary of the Daily Bugle. This magazine was a clear reference to the real-world Ms. Magazine, a popular women's liberation publication that was widely influential during the time that Ms. Marvel hit the scenes in the 70s. Its editor-in-chief, Gloria Steinem, was a huge figure in the rising women's liberation movement, and Carol's entire personality and design was modeled off of her, continuing Marvel's long and storied history of presenting what Stan Lee heralded as the world outside your window. With their books continuously reflecting real-world politics. Marvel has always been and always will be a reflection of the world right outside our window. That world may change and evolve, but the one thing that will never change is the way we tell our stories of heroism. Those stories have room for everyone, regardless of their race, gender, religion, or color of their skin. The only things we don't have room for are hatred, intolerance, and bigotry. We're all part of one big family, the human family, and we all come together in the body of Marvel. Ms. Marvel quickly became one of Marvel's most popular and recognizable female heroes, though there wasn't much competition in that department, and she became a major player in both the Avengers and X-Men series, which is why fans were really surprised that when Marvel was killed off in 1982, the mantle of Captain Marvel was given to a brand new character named Monica Rambeau, who had nothing to do with the mythos around the title. 
I mean, if Captain Marvel was already going to be replaced by a woman, many fans questioned why it wouldn't be the one that's been around since the very beginning. This same question popped up when the name was passed again, and again, and again. So when Carol finally got her shot in 2012, there were plenty of fans that were excited to see her long overdue time in the spotlight. Combine that with the one-two punch of solid writing and stellar art, and Carol's debut as Captain Marvel was an instant success, finally turning this series into a profit generator, a feat that was bolstered by a fan community called the Carol Corps that organically formed around the series. The Carol Corps was unlike anything the comic fandom had really ever seen. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were plenty of online communities that discussed comic books, but the core was special and unique in that it was a tight-knit network that was made up almost exclusively of female comic fans. A demographic that was really starting to blossom and bring in new readers with titles like The Runaways and Saga, along with the success of DC's Young Justice animated series. 2012 was also the heyday of Tumblr.com, which swiftly became the de facto social media site for female and LGBT comic fans to gather, making it the primary hub for the Carol Corps to spread and gather new members. Yet even outside of Tumblr, support for the Captain Marvel series can be seen no matter where you turn in the comic fandom, because the Carol Corps was continuously loud and proud. This set the stage perfectly for a brand new character to hit the scenes that catered to this ravenous fan base. And what better place to start than with a successor to Carol's old identity, Ms. Marvel? With the Marvel Cinematic Universe firmly established as the face of pop culture, the company put a lot of effort into brand synergy, heavily promoting characters that were either already on the big screen or were at least on the way. If an MCU property is about to get a new installment, then you better believe that there's going to be a related comic that drops around a year prior in order to build up hype. Yet in the early 2010s, there were a couple of film franchises that were out of Marvel's hands, which prevented them from total box office superhero domination. Famously, Marvel went bankrupt in 1996, forcing them to sell off the film rights to all of their most popular properties at the time in order to get back to a healthy financial state. Most notably for this video were the movie rights to the X-Men, which were snatched up by Fox. Much like the Captain Marvel trademark of the past, Fox had to use it or lose it when it came to the X-Men. If they stopped making X-Men films, then the rights would go back to Marvel. And there was no way in hell that they were going to do that, forcing Fox to churn out movie after movie, regardless of quality. Did you just call me? Blob. Around 2013, Marvel started to noticeably downplay the X-Men's role in the comics, and although it was never outright stated, it's pretty obvious in hindsight that this was done to start having their role be overtaken by a new, yet similar group called the Inhumans. These guys are seemingly regular humans that have a latent gene within their DNA that once activated unlocks changes within their bodies that can be as small as granting the person the ability to shoot fire to huge changes that physically alter their entire body. And yeah, that sounds a lot like the mutants. You know, seemingly regular humans that have a latent gene within their DNA that once activated unlocks changes in their bodies that can be as small as granting that person the ability to shoot fire to huge changes that physically alter their entire body. Despite being around for just as long as mutants, the Inhumans were never really a big deal at Marvel. Probably because instead of being relatable, everyday people with normal problems, which is the bread and butter of most good Marvel heroes, the Inhuman comics instead revolved around the royal family and the politics that came alongside them. This would change in 2013's Infinity Event, though, where the king of the Inhumans, Black Bolt, detonated a surplus of Terrigen, the substance that triggers inhuman genes. This caused a massive cloud of the stuff to make its way across the planet, transforming normal everyday civilians that had the dormant in human genes, which essentially just made them mutants, but with a gassy origin story. This entire campaign to turn the Inhumans into the next big thing proved to be a massive flop for Marvel, which definitely wasn't helped by the release of that god-awful Inhumans TV show that a lot of people hated or didn't even realize came out, and I did cover that in a dedicated video. But very few of these new Inhumans, which I shit you not were called new humans with an NU, resonated with readers. You don't really see a lot of people talking about how much they love Frank McGee or Noculus, but there was one huge exception, a new human that became an all-out phenomenon. That's right, we're finally going to be talking about Kamala Khan. Thank you so much for bearing with me while I set up all of that extremely tedious context. Created by G. Willow Wilson, Sana Aminat, and Adrian Alfona, Kamala Khan is a geek that many of us millennial and Gen Z fans either were, or knew, or frankly, still are. She's your stereotypical Tumblr girl obsessed with gaming and fanfiction. She can only communicate through nerd speak and can seemingly only process things by comparing them to pop culture references. Kind of like Abed from Community, or as clearly just demonstrated, me. 
Kamala is a dork full of insecurity, anxiety, and normal teenage problems, who is trying to understand her place in the world as she grows older, with the looming threat of adulthood just around the corner. Unlike a lot of fictional teenagers, Kamala is very much drawn and depicted like, you know, an actual teenager, not just a miniature adult. For context, here are three actresses at age 16. Those are just children. Compare that to fictional 16-year-olds, which are either depicted or just straight up are literal adults that are hanging out in high school. Kamala is by no means ugly, but she's also not the embodiment of female beauty standards that are imposed on little girls from an extremely young age. But it's also worth noting that her powers give Kamala the ability to transform her body. That's usually just reserved for her to grow and shrink, but she also has the ability to shapeshift. Kamala is a massive superhero fangirl, especially for Captain Marvel. And when she emerges from her cocoon, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Inhumans hatch out of those, she subconsciously transformed into Carol Danvers. Kamala had become everything that she was socially conditioned to think would make her happy. Skinny, blonde, beautiful, and light-skinned. But as she says herself, getting all of that didn't actually make her happy. Using her newfound powers to do good and make a difference is what did. On top of that, Kamala's stretchy powers are a physical manifestation of her awkward nature, of the weirdness that one feels when going through puberty and wading through adolescence, making this power set perfect for this character and storyline. And boy howdy did the readers agree. With the Carol core firmly established and growing with the continued popularity of female targeted comic series, Ms. Marvel was given an amazing first push when it was released. I mean, hell, the group even started to interchangeably refer to itself as both the Carol core and the Kamala core. Places where the group thrived, such as Tumblr, immediately embraced Kamala, and it became a huge trend to fill in the half-faced design of the first issue's cover with themselves, proving to be a great source of free marketing. And if you want further proof, then look no further, because this worked on me. Yeah, Ms. Marvel is actually one of the comics that got me into this hobby in the first place. See, for those of you that don't know, I only started reading comics in 2014 because the girl I was dating at the time introduced me to them. And yeah, 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 I know that is completely backwards for how that normally goes. But I quickly fell in love with this medium and I immersed myself in the fandom. I read dozens of issues a day and learned everything that I could about the industry and its history. Now, I have read literally thousands of issues and I started this entire channel to convince folks to give this hobby a shot and to also help people understand that you can jump into comics literally anywhere because you really don't need to know decades and decades worth of lore to find something that's fun to read. Ms. Marvel was the first comic that I ever subscribed to, but take a look at my copy. You notice how there's a blue stripe down here and not a red one like I've been showing in images prior? Well, that's because this is the second printing of the book. I was a little late to the game on things. But yeah, Ms. Marvel was so popular that it completely sold out when it was first released. And in the end, Marvel had to do seven printings. That's a number that only happens when it's a big name hero like Batman or Spider-Man. And on top of that, Ms. Marvel dominated the digital sales charts, which makes a lot of sense considering that print media has been on the decline for years and not everybody is fortunate enough to have a local comic shop. But of course, there's the looming elephant in the room. Kamala is Marvel's first major attempt at a Muslim superhero. This subject is handled with a lot of care by writer G. Willow Wilson, who was raised atheist and converted to Islam in college after studying multiple religions, and living for many years in Cairo where she worked as a journalist. Personally, I'm not all that well versed in Islam, but the general reception from people that are have said that the Ms. Marvel series does a great job of presenting Kamala's faith. Her relationship with her religion is a significant part of her life, and while detractors of these kinds of diverse characters like to get up in arms about how I'm not mad that these characters exist, I'm mad that their identity is their whole personality. Because they don't seem to understand that for plenty of people, their cultural identity is actually a significant part of their life. And hell, oftentimes it's made a big deal by forces that are outside of their control. Take for instance Kamala's close friend Nakia, who wears a hijab. She wants to just go about her life and be a normal person, but it's other people that draw attention to her faith. Kamala Khan also took center stage in 2015 when a racist organization called the American Freedom Defense Initiative took out anti-Islam ads on several buses in San Francisco, prompting an activist group to vandalize them with images of Ms. Marvel, turning them into banners that called for the end of hatred towards Muslims, and this gained national attention. In addition to that, when Donald Trump was running for, and then elected president in 2016, Ms. Marvel became a popular protest symbol, which makes a lot of sense considering his views on Muslims and refugees. It is impossible to ignore that Kamala was a movement, and that she was here to stay. But also, she eclipsed the Inhumans, kind of like how in the 90s, Wolverine eclipsed the X-Men. But also like the 90s, Marvel got a taste of success, and they became desperate to capture that lightning in a bottle once again, ushering in 
The Age of Diversity. There was a lot of good that came out of this, but also some major missteps. Based on interviews with G. Willow Wilson, Marvel's higher-ups specifically approached her to write Ms. Marvel because they took notice of their rising female demographic and wanted to further expand their readership. It would be a huge gamble, but Marvel wanted to produce a Muslim-American heroine, fully expecting the series to get immediate backlash, but agreeing that it was a risk that was worth taking if they were going to expand their demographic. These interviews made it clear that Marvel was set on doing a push for more diverse characters, and that Ms. Marvel was only just a small part of the overall plan. Which is why I think it's not all that much of a coincidence that Sam Wilson became Captain America and Jane Foster became Thor that very same year. In addition to that, writer Jonathan Hickman had been building towards his 2015 Secret Wars event that would serve to restructure the Marvel Universe in a way that would allow for several new characters to take center stage. So it's not all that hard to imagine that the critical and commercial success of Ms. Marvel encouraged the company to not just stay the course, but to go one step further by bringing in even more diverse characters than initially planned. Immediately following Secret Wars, Kamala was given an even bigger push as she was made one of the main characters for the newly relaunched Avengers series, alongside Captain Falcon, Jane Foster, Sam Alexander, who's the hip new Latino incarnation of Nova, and Miles Morales, who was brought over from the Ultimate Universe into the mainline continuity because of a cheeseburger that he had in his pocket. Yeah, I'm completely serious about that. In fact, I actually have a dedicated video all about it if you want more information. But one thing that's really disappointing about Kamala being shoved to the forefront of Earth's Mightiest Heroes is that it kind of goes against everything that makes her story special. See, stories about Kamala are generally small-scale, friendly neighborhood-style superheroics. She and her ragtag team of civilian friends don't fight off alien invasions, but they do make sure that the bodega on the corner is safe from gentrification. These all-new, all-different Avengers were the most diverse Avengers lineup that Marvel had ever released, but it was also short-lived because the team was split up pretty damn quick, with the young heroes all going on to form the Champions, Marvel's answer to the Teen Titans. As the face of Marvel's youth, Kamala became the leader of the Champions, and the comic was basically just a platform to show off even more young and diverse heroes like Ironheart, Wasp, Brawn, Locust, Snowguard, Starling, Falcon, and Patriot, just to name a few. It's honestly impressive how many characters Marvel tried to shove into the Champions, and Man, it just did not work. With many of these new young heroes not being given any real screen time for readers to fall in love with them in favor of just continuously trying to shove more and more and more characters down your throat. And that is a massive shame because the Champions is like a spiritual successor to the Young Avengers, which I personally adored. It managed to introduce a group of new and diverse characters, but they actually focused on telling a good story first and foremost. And they really allowed you to build up a fondness for each and every member of the team. The Champions certainly had a lot in common with the Young Avengers, but the overall tone of the book was wildly different, as it was clearly trying to channel this, like, chaotic Gen Z energy, but missed the mark on that in many, many ways. This is actually a recurring criticism that I have with its writer, Mark Wade, because while he's proven to be a competent writer and comes off as well-meaning, he can also come off as very, how do you do, fellow kids? The Champions are just one of the examples of how, while Marvel's big diversity push from 2014 to 2017 did see a lot of success, there were also plenty of blunders as well. The big ones that come to mind are the absolutely abysmal introduction of Ironheart and the truly, truly terrible America Chavez solo series. This period of time got people massively riled up on every side of the political spectrum, though the biggest reactions came from the right-wing folks who got very uh, emotional about quote-unquote SJW Marvel, and they had huge outbursts whenever a new diverse character was put out. And they did this without actually reading the books to find out if they were actually bad. Don't get me wrong, there were some bad stuff, but it wasn't all atrocious like that. If you had anything positive to say, then you were just a shill being paid by Disney. And, uh, no, we're not. Like, don't get me wrong, I would love some of that Disney money to pay my bills. And thank God you guys have watched this far, because I guess, like, at this point, there's been, what, two or three ad breaks by now? The Carol Corps had also become nearly non-existent within the comic fandom during this time, due to their main hub of Tumblr losing a sizable portion of its user base after being sold to Yahoo, and then later Verizon. 
On top of that, a significant subcommunity of the Carol Corps was the Valkyries, a Facebook group of women that worked in comic shops, which disbanded in 2018 after a call-out post from one of the few women of color within the organization detailed how the voices and perspectives of WOC were frequently overlooked and straight up ignored within the group as they more or less just elevated the voices of white feminism. Then of course, Marvel's diversity push imploded on itself in early 2020 with the announcement of the characters Safe Space and Snowflake, a couple of truly awfully designed characters that were trying so desperately hard to come off as inclusive that they ended up becoming a parody of themselves. When these character designs dropped, they were rightfully torn to pieces, even by me, and the backlash was so bad that that book never actually made it to print. It's likely because of criticism like this that Marvel has kind of been cooling their jets a bit in terms of adding diverse characters to their universe, with it most being felt in the Champions book, which now opts to focus in on its core group of heroes instead of continuously trying to push out new ones they refuse to give screen time and develop. You know, like they should have been doing this entire time. Look, inclusivity and diversity is never a bad thing, and Marvel absolutely did have successes in this era. But I think some of that success went to their heads, leading in a few instances to them just creating characters without giving any real attention to their storylines, which led to some half-baked books that needed a little bit more time in the oven. Ugh! It's raw! Don't get me wrong, it's very few of these books that were truly bad, but the fact of the matter is that a large handful were either just okay or only pretty good, and that was more than enough reactionaries to latch onto and get up in arms about the supposed downfall of Marvel. But thankfully it looks like the company is on a mission to course correct while not abandoning their morals. Unfortunately though, it seems like the damage is already done, because a lot of people that jump ship simply aren't aware of all the good books that are currently coming out, and instead they only hear about the wokeness thanks to the echo chambers that they put themselves in. Marvel has been putting out tons of great stories, and if we want them to continue, then it's up to us to spread the word, and also be an inclusive community to bring in new readers to this criminally overlooked hobby. It really pisses me off that Marvel and DC refuse to advertise their comics outside of other comics and in comic stores, so I guess it's up to fans like me to do their job for them. So hey, hey, go, go read Marauders. Also, uh, Marvel, DC, uh, other publishers, if you want someone to take over your marketing, hire me because y'all suck at it. And on that note, uh, if you like this video, then please consider subscribing or even watching another one. And if you like this, well, hey, you probably like Marvel comics. So good news, I have a playlist with every single one of my Marvel videos in one convenient place. So uh, maybe click that and watch some of those. But anyway, I hope you learned at least a little something new and hopefully I'll see you next time.